Biodiversität zu Köln ernennt Herr Prof. Dr. Michael Tomasello im BI für Evolutionäre Anthropologie Universität Leipzig zum Albertus Magnus Professor 2014. Meine herzlichen Glückwunsch. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Spink, and Rector. Um, very honored uh, to be the Albert Magnus Professor for 2014 here in this beautiful city. And uh, thank you. And I look forward. I'm going to have a long day tomorrow talking to, uh, having a seminar, talking to people, and uh, uh, another talk tomorrow night. So thank you very much for your attendance and attention. Um, from the beginning of the Western intellectual tradition. A central question has been, what makes humans human? What makes humans unique? From Aristotle on, Descartes also quite prominently, there was comparison to other animal species to see as a way of addressing the question of what makes humans human and what makes humans specifically different from other animals. But they were at a strong disadvantage, thank you. From Aristotle right on through, all the major thinkers in the Western intellectual tradition, when they were comparing humans to animals, they were comparing them to birds, rats, domesticated animals, the stray fox or wolf. There were no non-human primates in Europe. So their idea of humans versus animals was a much larger gulf than actually exists. And what happened was that in the 19th century, uh, non-human primates, and especially great apes, you see pictures of the four great apes up here, started coming to Europe in various zoological gardens. In 1838, Charles Darwin encountered the orangutan Ginny at the London Zoo and was absolutely blown away. People had talked about missing links and things, and he said, come see Ginny. Uh, Queen Victoria, by the way, uh, described Ginny as disagreeably human. <laughs> So, uh, so it's really only since we've had access to our closest animal relatives that we can really ask the question meaningfully and specifically about how we differ from other animals and what makes us human. So in my two lectures, I'm thinking of them as a pair, tonight and tomorrow night, um, I'm going to report to you some of the research that we've done in our laboratory. Uh, the, major method being simply putting children and putting great apes in the same basic situation and seeing what they do and trying to note both similarities and differences. Um, and what I'm going to do um, tonight, we can't ask what makes humans different until we know what the baseline is. And so we're going to talk about the great apes, especially chimpanzees, because most of the work is done with chimpanzees. Uh, these are uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, bonobos, and orangutans. And they are, um, um, we, humans are in the great ape clade. And uh, we are going to look at what they do uh, tonight and then tomorrow. I will contrast that uh, with what human children do to try to look for uniqueness. And I will focus on, the, the, the major question is about cognition and thinking and dealing with problems and, and where we humans think we are special in many ways and, and very deeply, our rationality and normativity and so forth. Um, but one thing that has happened in the last few decades is that there has been what I can, I'll call a social term. People classically thought of cognition as solving problems in the physical world. Mathematics, spatial reasoning, quantitative reasoning of various kinds, causal reasoning, and that's of course a big part of it. But there is theorizing starting about 30 or 40 years ago saying, well, wait a minute, primates seem to be a lot smarter than they need to be to just go around picking fruit. <laughs> They're doing a lot more intelligent things than would be required to do the same basic kind of foraging that lots of mammals do. So why do they seem to be so clever? And the answer was, that while the physical world just sort of sits there and waits for you to figure it out, the social world, when you're interacting with it, it's trying to figure you out at the same time you're trying to figure it out. 
And so you really got to do something extra. And that's where the idea of Machiavellian intelligence was born, that non-human primates engage in um, this kind of um, uh, strategic thinking to try to outthink their competitors in their group and get more food and get more mates and do all the things that make them successful as a species. And at the same time, during the same period, there's always been some appreciation, and of course, I guess in the Western intellectual tradition, it really begins most prominently with Hegel, but um, in, in the more social science, in the more, let's say psychology, to be more restrictive about it, there came to be a much greater appreciation that the nature of human intelligence was inherently cultural. That a human being, by him or herself, who grew up on, her own, on his or her own, without any social interaction or culture, would not be um, that much different from apes um, in terms of their intelligence as an adult. To be, to have human intelligence, you need to grow up in a culture with the language, the social interactions, with people teaching you things, and so forth. So that recognition became um, ever greater. So it's this social term in both non-human primates and human cognition that, um, um, that focuses our attention on the topic of social cognition in particular as uh, what we want to focus on uh, to see how that might be different than humans. So in our 1997 book, um, we reviewed all the evidence that existed at the time uh, about whether non-human primates understood, I'm going to say, psychological states or intentional states or mental states of others. And there was no really good evidence for that. The title of my talk today is about chimpanzees having a theory in mind. That comes from David Premack's famous paper in 1978, where he claimed that they did, but the basis on a very flimsy experiment, actually. So we thought there was no good evidence. So we started attacking the problem kind of um, systematically here, and this is a little bit of a frightening diagram, so I apologize, but I'm gonna just, just get the basics here. Um, let's think about understanding others as intentional actors. What do we have to understand about them to be goal-directed intentional agents? When we observe somebody doing something, pursuing a goal, we can observe something like this. This is supposed to be a schematic of someone acting. They're doing the action. Here we have someone using a key on a box. So they're acting on a box, and the result they're producing could be one of several things. So for example, if they use the key on the box, at the top you see the box stays closed. In the middle, the box opens, and in the bottom, the box falls over. Okay, so this is what you can sort of observe on the surface, somebody doing something and some result. To understand really what's going on, though, we have to understand something about what their goal was. So if the goal was to open the box, so this is a picture of the desired state, the desired state is the goal, then that makes the middle one a success. That's what we wanted to do. This one in the middle is we opened it with success and I'm happy about it. If I don't open it, stays closed, then I'm unhappy. And if it falls off the table, I'm surprised and it's an accident. Okay? To interpret those as success or failure, we have to know what the goal is. Right? So this is going to be a central thing. Do you know what the other person's goal is? Um, and, this is why I say it's a little scary, okay, we don't need to pay attention to this, but then they decide what to do, they make decisions given their relevant skills and knowledge and, and the state of reality, and they form an intention that I'm going to use the key to act on the box, to open the box, okay? So I have to understand their goal, I have to understand their perception of reality, and the action they choose to uh, make reality match their goal. So let's then, from that kind of schematic, let's say, Let's ask, I'm going to ask you three questions tonight. The first is, do great apes, especially chimpanzees, that's most, 90% of their searches with chimpanzees, do they understand others' goals and intentions? Second, do they understand others' perception and knowledge? And third, do they understand others' false beliefs? And I'll explain why that's an important thing to, uh, 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 special, to um, mark as special when I get there. Um, our general tact has been to get converging lines of evidence on each of these. Any experiment you do has multiple interpretations, and I can promise you the reviewers at the journal and after it's published, everyone else will find those other interpretations and shout them at you loudly. Um, 
And so what we have tried to do is do multiple experiments aimed at the same piece of understanding so that any weakness of any one experiment uh, is counteracted by the fact that you have another experiment, each of which has their own weaknesses, but they're different weaknesses. And so they pile up as converging evidence. And the second is that in many of these experiments are um, based on the experiments with human, ch human children where everyone uh, has no problem interpreting them as the child understands goals or the child understands somebody else's intentions or whatever. Okay, so let's just look at some experiments here. This is what my stock and trade is uh, an experiment. Uh, and and, and uh, you know, I, I like to wax philosophical about interpretation, but on the ground is experiments. So, understanding goals. If I perform a successful action, so if I take the top off of this bottle or something like this, okay, then um, if it's successful, then you can't, then what I wanted to do and what I did are the same thing. So to tease them apart, what you have to do is you have to have an unsuccessful action or uh, some kind of an accident or some kind of a um, failure. And then what I wanted to do and what actually happened are different. And now what we want to see is, did they tune in to what you were intending to do, what you wanted to do, or what actually happened? And so here's our little, uh, first little experiment along those lines. What we're going to do is, um, we're going to, um, in both conditions, you're going to see a film of each condition. There's a, a, we call it, this is our, what we call unwilling and unable study. And what you're going to see here first um, is the unable. In both of them, the chimp never gets any food. That's important. In the warm-up, they're getting food, we're giving them food, we're handing them grapes, and now comes the test, they're never going to get food in any condition. The question is, why are they not getting it? And does that make a difference to their reaction? And so here's the first one, you can see. So this is Brian Hare uh, uh, attempting to give a grape to Frodo unsuccessfully. You see, he's, oh, okay, he's, and now Frodo's getting a little frustrated. <laughs> All right, and you can't really hear him, but I'm frustrated. All right. But he's hanging in there. And he's hanging in there because Brian is trying to give him the food. Okay, he's actually, that's his goal is to give it to him, and he's just being unsuccessful. But now watch when Brian is programmed to do basically the same thing. The food is going to go out and come back, but he's going to this time be teasing him. All right, so it's not going to be intending to give it to him. He actually intends not to give it to him, but the superficial action is the same in both cases. You see, Frodo doesn't like that very much. Starts to leave, bangs on the thing, bangs on it again, and leaves. <laughs> okay. All right. So he is programmed. His looking behavior is the same in both conditions. The grape is going out and back, but he's doing something. But in one case, he intends for him to have it. In one case, he doesn't. So what we did was we actually had three cases where we were unwilling. That was the tease. There's another one where it's right in front of him, and he just doesn't touch it. He's lazy, that we call it. And there's another one where he picks it up and eats it himself, which they really don't like. Okay? <laughs> but in those cases, his goal is not to give it to him. And then what we bashed with them was two other things on the other side. So what you saw on the unable side is clumsy, uh, and a case where the hole is too small, as opposed to lazy, he can't see it, as opposed to eating it himself, he's trying to open it. So in any case, in that, in that case, his goal is to give it to him, uh, but he's, again, failing in all cases. So um, what we see is outcome from Frodo, and obviously this is an experiment with you know, lots of individuals, they tend to be frustrated and they tend to leave when the guy doesn't give it to them, uh, when his goal seems to be to not give it to them, and when he seems to be trying to give it to them unsuccessfully, they stay and wait patiently because they're hoping that if he keeps trying, he'll be successful. Um, this is a study of helping, but to help someone, uh, you have to know what their goal is. I have to know what you are trying to do if I'm going to help you attain it. And so this is, a, a, you see this chimp here, is trying, this is at a sanctuary in Africa, uh, and this chimp is trying to get through the door, and that's because there's some food in the tire there. And you see the chain, and the chain is hooked up to another cage, and if you flip the chain, it'll open the door. Right? The, the chain is hooked up to a kind of a block in the door. Here comes the subject. This is the guy we're interested in. And he opens there and lets him go get food. 
The guy who opens the chain gets nothing out of it, ever. And he knows he's not going to get anything out of it because he knows that guy's not going to share. Uh, uh, and uh, he just opens it. We had a couple of different control conditions in experiments. You always have to have control conditions. Control condition, for example, if, the, if there's no chip there, how often do they just open that because it's fun to open it? We had a stronger control where he's trying to get out a different door, and that chain doesn't do anything to the open door. And much more often, when it's helping this guy, they do it. So they have to know he wanted to get through the door. And they don't do that when there's nobody there who wants to get through the door. Uh, another more recent study um, uh, had the following um, uh, structure to it. What we did was we gave, the, we gave the chimp some food from here, and then we walked over to another cage, and, and they followed, you know, and then we gave them some food here. So after you do that a few times, you give them some food here, and you stand up, they go, Okay, and they run over there, anticipating that you're coming over here to give them food over here. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the setup. And they, and they learn how to do that, and they, they, do, they learn how to do that quite quickly. And then what we do is, we have a caretaker comes in the door and throws, me my, throws keys toward me, and they land on the floor like this. And now I stand up like this. Now normally, as soon as I stand up and turn, they go over here like this. But in this case, because the guy tried to throw me the keys, and I turned like this, they don't go. Because they know that when I'm standing up turning, it's to get the keys, all right? And then we compare that to a condition where he's not throwing any keys. Actually, we compare it to a condition, I think I have that here, where he throws the keys and they land over here. Now I turn like this, and they go over here. So in the first case, they know, or at least they infer, that I'm standing up and turning in that direction to get the keys. And when the keys are behind me, they know I'm not turning to get the keys because the keys are back there. And so they assume I'm going to the uh, bucket with food just like before, and they shh, all right? So they are inferring your goal from the basis of the fact that they know, that they are quite familiar with keepers using keys and opening doors with keys. It's a quite prominent thing in their captive world. And, they, and so they infer that uh, his goal was to get the keys. Now this is a human race chip named um, Annette, and Annette, uh, uh, his mother didn't take care of her, and she would have died, and uh, human caretakers uh, uh, took her in and brought her up, and I'm happy to report that she's now um, very successfully and happily integrated into a chimp group in the Leipzig Zoo. Um, and this is a, a study of, of, of imitation, and the idea here, again, is the same that we're going to divorce successful action, and we're going we're to um, um, demodel for them a failed action. And she has several conditions here. So if you just give Annette uh, the white cup and that apparatus on the ground there, she never puts the cup on the pipe. Chimps are really good at tearing things apart and ripping things apart. They're not that good at constructing things, uh, putting things together. They're kind of like two-year-olds, I would say. Um, so, um, uh, so anyway, and, but if, if she puts the cup on the pipe, then Annette will quite often put the cup on the pipe when it's her turn. Okay? So um, if you don't model it, she almost never does it. If you model it, she does it. What if you attempt to do it, but you fail? Does that give her the cue to do it herself? And you'll see the answer here. This is, regardless of the keeper's acting abilities, which are not that great, uh, she's acting like she's trying to put it on. And now on that <laughs> okay. And so this was one where we had like we had like six different tasks, and um, uh, and you were trying to do it and failing to do it. So again, coming back to my um, uh, coming back to my uh, main point about the action is we're, again we're divorcing what you actually did from what you're trying to do, and she's copying what you were trying to do. And now this one, um, again, I told her we're doing converging operations here. This one was one of, uh, one of the more surprising ones that I've ever um, been uh, associated with. This is model on an infant study. This is the famous Gergay et al. Nature 2002 head touch paper, for those of you who are in the know. Um, and the basic idea is this. It's, it's called rational imitation is what they called it in the Nature paper. And the idea is that you're going to do something, and you would normally do it um, with, so, for example, he's, he's turning on the light by pressing this triangular thing, by pressing the button. 
And what you would normally do is you would turn it on with your hand, right? So what you would expect is that I'm going to turn it on with my hand. But in this side here with the bucket, his hands are busy, okay? His hands are full, he can't do it with his hands, and so he does it with his foot, okay? That makes sense. It makes sense because your normal way of doing it is not available, and so you use a backup way of doing it. It all makes sense. But what he's doing in the other one here doesn't make sense. He doesn't have anything in his hands. He could do it with his hands, but he's doing it with his foot anyway. So it doesn't really make sense. Now, you give it to the chimp. This is, again, modeled on an infant study, but um, you give it to the chimp in our study. They have no constraints. They can push it, you can, they can push it however they want. And so in the condition where your hands were full, they go ahead and use their hand. They're, they're, they're inferring, well, yeah, you know, if his hands had been free, he would have used his hands. That, that he would have done the normal thing. He didn't do the normal thing because he wasn't able to. So they use their hands. But when they see this demonstration over here, where he's using um, his uh, foot when he doesn't need to, now they use the foot. He must, have, he must have meant to use his foot. There's no reason why he didn't use his hands. I can't see any reason why he didn't use his hands. He must have had some reason for using his foot. And so they copy by doing it with the foot. Um, as I say, the, I was skeptical when David Butterman wanted to do this study, and I said, okay, give it a shot, and we'll, we'll see. These were human-raised chimps, and by the way, like Annette that you just saw, these were in a different place. These were human-raised human chimps, and that may make a difference. So um, for those of you who might want to discuss that issue, I'd be happy to discuss it. Chimps raised by humans have some different characteristics from others, but in any case, um, still they, were, they, they did this sort of amazing thing. So um, this is a summary of all the different studies that most of these are from our laboratory, almost all of them, yeah, for chimps, and uh, all of them from chimps now that I look at it, and, the best, and a good number of them from the kids, about half of them for the kids are from our lab as well. And there, some of them match sort of perfectly, and some of them are sort of close, uh, uh, like the, the Gerge and the Buttleman Butt that I just showed you, um, the, the head touch is not something they really did very naturally, so we came up with other things. So in any case, um, we have a specific comparison between children and kids, distinguishing when you're unwilling from when you're unable, distinguishing, I didn't show you this, but um, purposeful from accidental actions. So they don't copy when you do something, when you have an accident, they don't copy that, they only copy it if you do it on purpose. Uh, helping another fetch an outreach object, so you have to know what his goal is. Uh, reproducing a goal of a failed attempt, I showed you the Annette putting the thing on there, reproducing intention, around that. rational imitation, which I just showed you, which some people think now gets at intentions, um, and so forth. Okay, so we think this demonstrates with pretty good confidence, we have pretty good confidence that they're doing the same thing kids are doing. Now, if you want to be skeptical about what kids are doing, okay, now, okay, that's fine, but um, the mo almost all developmental psychologists who study kids would say, from the basis of these experiments you see here under children, that children understand others' goals and intentions. And so, you want <clears throat> to apply the same criteria, then we should make the same inference about chimps. <clears throat> okay, and, and by the way, if you're inferring from this that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a chimp promoter and I'm, and I'm pushing chimps as being just like humans and stuff, then you'll come tomorrow night and you'll see that I'm not, actually. I'm, not, I'm, I'm actually classified with someone who's always trying to sh show you the uniqueness of object. But we have to know what's the same before we can know what's different. Okay, secondly, understanding, I'm using the general term perception. Sometimes people use understanding attention, understanding, uh, and just in general, understanding that others see the world and that influences their action. So the most basic thing is Gaze following, and we actually um, did a number, several studies on this. Chimpanzees following their uh, gaze direction. Um, this is uh, Fraukia and Julian Breuer, and you'll see Julian Breuer looking up at the ceiling, and there's nothing up there. And so you'll see Fraukia looking up, and then oops, you'll see Fraukia looking up, and then. <laughs> and now there's nothing up there, but Juliana's still looking up. Okay. <laughs> So, okay, so that's certainly pretty, pretty as, as anecdotally, that's pretty compelling. It looks like what a human would do for sure. Um, but we did a number of other studies. Here's one. Um, we have four different situations. I'm, I'm showing you two of them. And the basic idea is, uh, actually the simplest situation is, is one like, like the one on, on this side here, where um, there's a barrier, and I'm looking at the chimp like this, and I just go like, but the chimp can't see back there because there's a barrier. 
And so the chimp has to actually go around and look around the barrier if he wants to see what I see. We have a control condition where either we look straight ahead or we look in the other direction like this. So, um, and we have four different situations like that. Here's one where we look out the door and he's got to come around to see out the door. We had one, uh, a couple of other ones as well. And um, like four times as often or five times as often, they uh, come around and look when you look behind the barrier as when you don't look or you look in another direction. Um, a variation on the theme. Now I'm going to look over here and they follow your gaze direction. So I'm going to look over here. But in, and in one case, I have this barrier in front of me, but it has a big window in it, so it's no problem. So I look over there, and I look at an object over there, and they follow my gaze direction. But now, the barrier has no windows. It's opaque. And now, I look over here, and the chimp, if he knows that I can't see through the barrier, I'm not Superman, I, have, I can't see through the barrier, then they actually come around and they look at the barrier. So you can see I have him depicted here. He comes around and looks to see what you're looking at in the barrier. And he doesn't look through to the object. So going back to the first one, he follows your gaze direction all the way to the target object. And here, he just follows it to the barrier. So they know something about um, line of sight. In addition to looking around things, they, um, they know that you can't see things when a barrier is in the way. And now perhaps our, uh, the study that really, I started with the quote from our own book saying there was no strong evidence. And as in science, when evidence starts piling up against your hypothesis or your previous conclusion, you don't jump right away to the other view. You, you sort of wait a minute until, until you're really convinced. And this is the one that put me over the edge uh, and, and changed my mind about it totally. Um, uh, so the idea here is, um, you're gonna, this is a subordinate chimpanzee over here behind this door. The door's cracked a little bit. Over here that you can't see, but you're going to see her in a minute, is a dominant chimp. And both of them's doors crack. So they can look into this middle room, and they can see what's in the room, and they can see the other one looking under her door. Right? So this is supposed to induce competition, which it does quite nicely. Uh, and some warm-up, getting them ready to do the real test. You can put a banana in the middle of the floor here, open both doors, and the dominant gets it every time. Okay. You say, how do, how do I know the dominant gets it every time? That's the way we define the dominance. The individuals who got it most, who got it all the time, they were the dominance, okay? So that's what we established in pretest. Who's the dominant? Who gets the food when it's out in the open? So now, we're going to do what we call our knowledge versus power experiment, <laughs> that is. Uh, here's a banana out in the open, sitting on top of this bucket. But what you can't see is there's another banana on the other side over there on the subordinate side. So the subordinate knows about a banana that the dominant doesn't know about. All right? So will she preferentially go for the one that the dominant doesn't know about? Now, importantly, we have to rule out a strategy which the subordinate could engage in, which would be wait and see where the dominant goes and then react and go to the other one. So we have several ways to rule that out. I'm just going to show you one. But uh, this one is that the dominant is going to go first. I mean, the subordinate, sorry. The subordinate that you're looking at has to choose first. And, and we actually have a criterion. As soon as her uh, foot hits the inside of the cage, then the other one's door opens. So she has to have a chance to, um, um, to go, she has to go first. She has to make her decision first. What you're going to see is the door's going to go down briefly first because we don't want them reacting to the other one looking at things. And then you'll see the subordinate um, make a choice. Sneaker. Grabs it, gets back in the cage. The dominant comes against that and now checks to see if there's any over here. Okay, just to make sure. Okay. Uh, we had, uh, I think, five, a series of five studies in this. We had one of them, for example, where that barrier was clear. So now, if she knew that the, the dominant could see through the barrier, then she shouldn't go for it, and they don't. They actually, most, most often when they do that case, is stay in the cage. They don't go for either one of them. They let the dominant have both of them. Right? So they only go when they know the dominant can't see it. Um, now, we did a variation on this theme, which was, um, you're looking from the top down. Here's the chimp. That's a human. The, the green thing is a human there. And there are two pieces of food. And if the chimp approaches the one over here to the left, out in the open, 
The human waits till she gets close and then grabs it. Okay? But over here, there's a barrier. And the chimp can go around on this side sneakily and grab it because the human can't see her. Um, and indeed, that's what chimps do. They go to the side where the experimenter can't see them approaching. Um, and, they, uh, and then we did a variation on this theme, which was um, uh, there was barriers on both sides. So now this is not picture. I'm, I'm, you have to modify the picture here. There are barriers on both sides. So the human can't see them in either way. But now, in one case, the door makes noise. In the other case, it doesn't make noise. And they learn in a pretest that the red door makes noise and the blue door doesn't, or whatever. Now they're in the test. Either way they go, the guy can't see them. But if they go here, the door makes noise and the guy grabs it first. If they go the other way, it doesn't make noise and he gets it. And they go to the side that's silent. So they know the other one can't. They know when the other guy can't see them and they know when the other guy can't hear them. We think this is important because all the studies that we've done, as well as other people, have all been in the visual domain. And the fact that they generalize this straight away to hearing, uh, that they know what the other guy can and can't hear, um, uh, generalizes it beyond just one perceptual domain, and therefore might suggest something more general, something more knowledge-like. Um, here's a, so actually one detail I didn't give you was that the human is kind of looking down. And so here, here you're gonna see, I believe this is one where, um, you're going to see, uh, this is one actually where there's no barrier on both sides. But it's, and the human is looking down, and watch how carefully she opens the door. It's making them... <laughs> Very careful not to make any noise. And now she gets the food, and the human actually is programmed to look up after 15 seconds or whatever. Uh, in that, if, she, if, she, if she doesn't hear anything, she looks up after 15 seconds. If she hears something, she grabs the food immediately as soon as she hears it. So there she didn't hear anything. But you, I just I sh wanted to show the video because I wanted to show you this, this careful behavior, which you would never see if they... We, we have, of course, have a condition where there's no human there. We call it the non-social control condition. In many of these studies, we have a non-social control. And if there's a non-social control, the chimp just goes over like that. So clearly uh, adjusting to the human. Um, two studies where um, we uh, study the, their understanding of knowledge. And one of them was a follow-up to this. So I'm just going to show you this, but it's slightly different. So what we have here is we have one piece of food. In the study of do they understand knowledge, um, this piece of food, I'm oh, sorry, sorry. And here we have two pieces of food. I'm sorry, I'm this book. Here we have two pieces of food, one that the dominant can see and one that the dominant cannot see. In the study on knowledge, there's only one piece of food. So there are two barriers like this, and the food is gonna come in, it actually comes in on like a fishing rod, okay? The food comes in, they're both watching under the door like this, here comes the food. And the food, let's say I'm the subordinate, the food comes on my side. So now I can, only I can see the banana, you can't see it. You're the dominant, you can't see it, I can see it. So now it's just like this situation here, with this hidden food, right? It's just like this. I can see it, you can't see it. So if all they understood was what somebody's visual perception was landing on, then they should uh, go, for the, go for the food. But he just saw it hidden. <laughs> he watched it going there. So even though he can't see it now, he knows it's there. Now the word no is loaded and the philosopher says <laughs> no. But let's say a very thin sense of no, say Kinnon versus Vissen, for example. He's familiar with it. He saw it there a moment ago. So he knows it's there in the sense that he saw it there going there a minute ago. So if the other guy sees it going there, I stay away from it, even though he doesn't see it now. The control condition is um, his door is down. Now it comes in and it goes there. Now his door is up. This is identical to the other situation. Absolutely identical. And the only difference is, did he see it being hidden a moment ago or not? If he did not see it being hidden a moment ago, I go for it. If he sees it being hidden, I don't go for it. So we think this demonstrates that they understand not just the immediate perception of others, but others' knowledge, where, again, uh, we don't mean knowledge in some deep scientific sense, but knowledge in a sense of um, uh, perceptual acquaintance, if you will. 
Um, and then we have another study that Kaminsky et al. 2008. I don't, I didn't, um, I, it's, I didn't want to show the, um, uh, uh, show the whole experiment because it's a little bit complicated. But I'll give you the simple version. The simple version. We actually this is in a paradigm that we um, we call chip chess because it goes back and forth like this. It, they, they take turns. And the paradigm is that um, there are two chimps on either side of a booth like this. And what they learn in, in, a, in a sort of pre-training is that it'll be my turn to take some food, and then it's your turn to take some food, then my turn, then your turn. So they learn about going back and forth, taking turns, taking food off of this board. There's a board that comes to me, and then the board goes to you, and back and forth. And so in the critical test, what we have is we have two buckets, two cups or something like, and um, then we put an occluder right here, we put a board right here, and uh, there are actually, actually three cups. And the board covers two of the cups, like this, and one cup is out of the other. So now, we both watch a banana go in this cup. So we both are watching it go in there, we both know it's there, and I know you know it's there, because I'm watching, okay, you, you know it's there. Then another piece of banana goes in this cup here, but you don't see it. So only I know about this one, but we both know about this one. Yeah, we both know about this one, but only I know about this one. Now, it goes over to you, I don't get to see what you choose, and then it's back to me. <laughs> Which one should I go for? Should I go for the one that we both saw, or should I go for the one that only I saw? Well, I'm figuring you only know about one of them. That's the one you're going for. So this is the one that must be left. So I go for the one that you don't know about, uh, figuring that you couldn't have chosen that one because you didn't know about it. So um, that's what they do, and so this is still another uh, paradigm, another experimental paradigm, uh, suggesting that they know not only what others see in the moment, but what they know, because this one is displaced in time as well. So here's another. The, these two um, 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 summary tables are from a paper that I'm going to show you and we'll refer to in just a moment. Uh, again, we have chimp studies, we have kid studies, the chimp studies that I just report here are all done in our lab, the children's studies in this case are all but one done, in, all but two done in our lab, and the match is pretty good in most of them, not, uh, and sometimes it's the same study for both of them. Uh, following gaze around barriers, uh, looking for the observer side of a barrier, uh, didn't give you the visual gestures one, uh, go for the food only when the dominant cannot see it, um, conceal your approach to food, eat both visual and auditory, go where the guy can't see you or where the guy can't hear you. Um, go for the food only when the dominant didn't see the hiding, that was the last one, which I'm going to call um, knowledge, or they know about knowing, not just about seeing. And uh, then the choosing the food that the competitor didn't see being hidden. Um, so, uh, uh, one, one, one uh, recent one, I just want to, I, I just want to, um, uh, mention to you, it doesn't fit in this schema quite perfectly, so I'll just mention it and then I'll, and then I'll um, uh, draw the larger conclusion in just a moment. Um, because this has that same chip chess model, this back and forth. And it's based on the following um, phenomenon. If I'm a chimp and you hide food for me, and I'm, 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 you're hiding it and I'm getting it, and now there are two boards like this lying on the table, and you hold up a piece of food, and then I don't get to see where you hide it, but then you move the occluder, and one board is still flat like this, and the other board is leaning like this, okay? Where's the food? Well, they're quite good at that, okay? They choose the board that's leaning. They, the, the, the food could not be under the flat board. There's no room for it. It has to be under this one, okay? So they do that quite easily. So now we use the same chimp chest paradigm, and we said, do they know that the other guy is going to make that inference, okay? So the other guy, is, we have to do some sort of tricky things, uh, but what we do is there's a food well underneath in the table, so it goes down. So in fact, it can lie flat, okay? Uh, so I see food going in both wells like this. You don't see them. Then what you see is one board flat and one board up like this, Okay, and now I don't see what you choose, and it comes back. Uh, I figure you didn't choose this one, because you would never think the food was under there. You would think it was under here. So um, they understand that others make inferences. My colleague in Munich, Bayaba Sodian, was quite excited about this finding because um, she's been studying human infants making inferences, um, and, and this is the same, making it, sorry, 
understanding that others make inferences and not just perceive things, not just know things, but make inferences, and um, that if the board is slanted, there must be food under there. If the board's not slanted, there must not be food under there. Um, and this is um, um, quite surprising to a lot of people who haven't looked at um, eggs very much. So this is the paper that I was, the summary paper that both of those big tables came from, the two big tables that I showed you, the summary tables. Um, uh, Woodruff and Premack in 1978, had the famous paper, the chimpanzees have a theory of mind, or does the chimpanzee have a theory of mind? And Trends in Cognitive Science asked Joseph Paul and me uh, to revisit this question 30 years after the original study, so 2008 versus 1978. Um, and this is the substance of what was in that paper, this is what I presented to you here, is all of these studies organized by showing that there are multiple methods giving the same answer, converging operations on the same answer, and a correspondence to young children's behavior, which is unproblematically considered mentalistic and, and, and understanding mental states by others, by, by many scholars. A couple of the studies were after, that I showed you tonight were after that um, review paper, um, and so based on all of it, um, I would say that we can infer that chimpanzees understand others as goal-directed, perceiving, knowing, inferring <laughs> agents. And again, I have our, my head back here. This is a simplified version of my scary diagram, which is they understand that you have a goal and that you perceive the world and that your action is a function of your goals and perceptions. So thinking about the food competition situation, <clears throat> if we had a rock out there instead of a banana, okay, you see it, but you don't want it, you don't go for it. If we have the banana, but he doesn't see it, that's exactly what we had in our study, he wants the banana, but he doesn't see it, so he doesn't go for it. If he sees it and he wants it, he goes for it. Okay? So you have to have both the goal and the knowledge, the requisite knowledge, and if I know what your goal is, and I know what your knowledge is, then in many situations I'll be able to predict what you're going to do. So this is the social cognition of non-human primates, of great apes in particular, uh, there are some studies with monkeys showing some similar things, but there's not nearly as much research, and so I'm going to stick, keep my conclusion to great apes. Some of these studies have been done with other great apes, and most of them with chimpanzees, so to be safe, I should say chimpanzees then. Um, but one of the things that we ended up concluding after um, looking at a number of these um, studies and thinking about why in the studies that existed before, in 1997 when we did our book, and when I said we have no good evidence of understanding um, um, others as mental agents or whatever, is that all the people who had tried and failed before, including ourselves, had tried to study them in situations of cooperation. So we're communicating with them, or we're trying to help them do something, and they're just not getting it. They're not understanding what our goals are, they're not understanding it. When we made the turnaround was in these competi food competition experiments looking into the door that I showed you in the video. There, it's really important to them to know what the other guy wants and what the other guy sees. And so it's really in competition that they exercise their social cognitive skills. And what's missing is using those in communication and cooperation. And that's going to be one of my uh, main themes uh, tomorrow. Now, I want to mention now, I'm not going to go into it in too much detail, I told you the third area was false beliefs. There are some people who think that all of this stuff that I just told you about is really nice, okay, really interesting, but the real thing is understanding false beliefs. And the reason is that, um, in a nutshell, is that to really understand another is having a representational view of the world, that I have to know that you I have to know that you act not on what is the case, but on what you believe to be the case. That's when I really know, that's when I really have a theory of mine, is that I know, uh, I see you um, on your knees looking under the table there, but the ball is over here. How do I explain your ridiculous behavior? Because you think the ball is under the table, and now it all makes sense. You're, you're, you're searching where you think it is. and so. We have tried now um, four different times. We have four published papers. These are not failed experiments in our, in our drawer somewhere. These are all four published studies um, where we have not 
gotten them to understand the false belief. So one quite simple one is the one that you saw. Again, this food competition experiment. Um, what I showed you before was um, the other guy doesn't know where the, that the banana is there. But we have another version of it, and that's the uninformed version. He doesn't know it's there. But we have the misinformed version. So here we are. I'm the subordinate. You're the dominant. We're looking. We both see the food go over here. Now your door is closed. Sneakily, the experimenter is moving over here. Okay. So if I understand that you have a, that you act on your beliefs, not that you act on where it really is, but that you act on your beliefs, I'm going to think you're going to go here. Right. And so I should be able to get this, no problem, because you're going to be going there, because you think it's over there, and it's really over here. And um, they don't do any better than the one where he's ignorant. So um, uh, I think you saw one title back here. Uh, uh, chimpanzees know what others know, but not what they believe. Okay? They know that others, either they saw it going there, but they can't uh, predict what the other one's going to do based on the fact that he has a false belief. So. Um, uh, and that's, that's one version of it, uh, and, and there you can see they behave the same whether the guy is just uninformed or whether the guy is misinformed, and they behave exactly the same. And they should be better when he's misinformed, because then they know what he's going to do. When he's uninformed, you don't know what he's going to do. But when he's misinformed, you should know he's going for that one. Uh, I think I'm not going to go into this. This is, a, this is a fairly complicated one for those of you who are in the know about uh, theory of mind stuff. This is a change locations paradigm. This is a uh, change contents paradigm. They think the banana's in there, but then while they're not looking, somebody changes it for a grape, and, and they don't get that one either. And in fact, here are there are five studies. I said four. There are actually five. Um, uh, there are four of them that actually are compared to children. They have various different characteristics of them. Some have a human partner, some have a chimp partner. Uh, some is more cooperation. We have a couple that are competitive, so um, where they actually compete with one another. Like the, I'd say the, the one I just showed you with the food competition is one. Uh, the control condition, there are two um, really important control conditions. One is a true belief, that is, the other guy sees it being moved, okay? So you have to compare it to the situation where he sees it being moved, for example. Or, um, uh, so that's, that's the um, true belief control or ignorance control, where um, he doesn't know where it is versus he, it's changed. And those are the two best controls you can have for false belief. There's an ignorance control and a true belief control. And all of our studies have one or the other, sorry, four of the five have one or the other of those. Uh, and the one at the top doesn't actually have either one of those. So that's why I was saying four studies before. Sometimes they had training, and a couple of them they had little or no training, uh, different responses, uh, paradigms. So um, there's a dictum in experimental psychology that um, um, uh, absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. <laughs> so so um, the fact that we uh, are not getting it does not mean they don't do it or they don't know it. It just means we haven't found a, a, a way yet. So what we have to conclude is we have no evidence that they understand false belief. And if anybody is clever enough to have another idea about how to do this, that they might do it, then uh, I'm listening. Uh, but uh, for now, everything we can think of, they haven't been able to do. Now, um, you might ask, why exactly this line? Why not false beliefs? And this is an answer that's way more, way deeper uh, uh, philosophically in other ways than, than I'm probably capable of going. Um, but uh, what I'm going to argue to you in general um, tomorrow, to presage the talk tomorrow, is that apes are really good at what we might call individual intentionality. And this means both acting intentionally themselves, they pursue goals, they pursue goals strategically, uh, all kinds of uh, things. They, but in addition, they understand others as intentional. This is not the same thing as being intentional yourself. I think they're pretty much all intelligent animals are intentional agents themselves, pursuing goals in a flexible way. But understanding others as intentional agents, understanding that they have goals and perceptions, might be restricted to primates. There might be some mammals and who knows, and nobody knows what those birds are doing, uh, and Nikki Clayton's uh, um, crows and whatnot. Uh, but in any case, um, understanding intentions and understanding intentions is something uh, different. But it's still all individual, and especially if you're doing it in competition. What's he doing? What does he want? What's he trying to do? And what I'll argue to you tomorrow is that what really makes a difference for humans is that they put their heads together 
and form a joint goal. And they do things together, cooperatively. And this joint goal has the structure that you and I are both trying to do this together, but you have your role and I have my role. Uh, we're perceiving something together, we have joint attention on it, but you have your perspective, you're seeing it from this direction, I'm seeing it from this direction. This structure of cooperating together, but with our different roles, attending to something together, but with our different perspectives, this is going to shift everything. It's going to make human cognition intersubjective, it's going to give us a perspectival view on things, when you throw communication in there, it's going to give us a recursive structure. I'm wondering what you're thinking about what I'm thinking. So we get perspective, we get recursion. Again, I'm going to go into this tomorrow. But um, uh, the proposal with my uh, latest book especially that uh, Professor Speer referred to in the Natural History of Human Thinking is that it's this particular type of cooperative and communicative social engagement that leads to the unique form of human thinking. Of course we think spatially and causally about the physical world, but chimps are pretty good at that also. And it, the, the real difference is, is that this form of social engagement changes the nature of the way we represent the world cognitively and the kinds of inferences we make about it, especially these recursive uh, type of inferences. So how does this relate to false belief? Well, I'm not 100% sure about this, but um, in the new book, I try to make the argument that um, the human, our human sense of an objective world, independent of us, is a world that's perspectiveless. It doesn't matter how I look at it, it doesn't matter how you look at it, it is the way it is. So it's, it's from uh, Thomas Nagel's famous term, the view from nowhere. Okay? Where, okay, the objective world is somehow independent of individual perspectives. And to pass the false belief task, notice that in the false belief task, you see it hidden here, and then you go away, and it's moved to here. Now you come back. The actual situation is, I know it's here, and you think it's here. But if we're on an equal plane, then why should my opinion be any better than yours, okay? I think it's here, you think it's there, you know, it's a toss-up, so what? No, 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 it's really there. Well, how do you know it's really there? Well, because I saw it go there. So, I, I think there's this notion of an objective world that is independent of what I think and what he thinks that is the arbiter that says it's a false belief. It's not really where he thinks it is. It's over there. So I actually think that this notion of an objective world that then makes somebody's belief false about it, um, is, it comes from a kind of an intersubjective uh, uh, construal of things that is part and parcel of growing up in a human cultural world with um, language and collaborative interactions and perspective and so forth and so on. So, a little hand wavy uh, explanation there, but I'm just searching to try to assimilate the false belief, the difference between humans and chips and understanding false beliefs, to something that we know pretty well and that I'll try to argue tomorrow with, with, with evidence, uh, that if this difference between being uh, an individual thinker and being a um, joint or collective uh, thinker. So, just a quick summary. Apes understand action in terms of goals and intention and perception knowledge, the action of others. Uh, especially in competition, but they don't understand false beliefs and, and the topic for tomorrow, uh, or joint goals and attention, cooperative communication, cooperative culture, shared intentionality. Uh, it's that part that we're going to uh, single out uh, as being special. Thank you.